First thing on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Move approval. Second. We have a approval, a motion to approve, and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Citizens to be heard. Anybody out there that wants to talk that's not on the agenda? I think you guys are on the agenda. Okay, we'll move on. Approval of the minutes for October the 8th. So moved. Mr. Chair, I do have a uh, couple of corrections. Okay. Uh, if we can do that mm -hmm. before. Uh, Kalina, on, um, on page five, um, <laughs> in about the middle of the page, I can kind of point out here for you. <laughs> <coughs> the sentence where it says one of their reasons was to take the 30-day time period to make that decision. Mm -hmm. uh, that really, sh <coughs> that really should say one of their reasons uh, was they only had a 30-day time period to make that decision. Okay. Now they had a 30-day period yeah. to yeah. to make the appeal. So, <coughs> and then also then. Um, for a little bit further down, it said the DNR had 54 conditions on the permit and were seeking further conditions. We, that just needs to be changed because the DNR wasn't seeking further conditions. It was the Buffalo Red Watershed District who was seeking further conditions. So, just, yeah. so you know, I suggest that it say DNR had 54 conditions on the permit. The, the Buffalo Red Watershed District were seeking further conditions that were needed. And then the very next sentence, it states they had accepted additional conditions. And, and I think it sh that should state the diversion authority had accepted additional conditions that the watershed board requested. My motion will include those changes. Second. Any other changes? Or? Now we've got a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, to accept the minutes as amended. Approval of the bills and vouchers. And we move to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion and second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, opposed? With that, we'll go on to the Metricock, uh, Metro Grove 2045, a request for approval of resolution 2019-37. Michael Maddox, Transportation Planner for Metricog, and the C. Cindy, you're here too. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And you want to tell us today about Metrogrow? That's right. So I'll start us off this morning. I'm Cindy Gray, Executive Director for, for uh, Metrocog. And uh, before I even started at Metrocog, this plan was underway, so it's been going for about a year and a half now. And um, you know, we gave about an hour presentation on this at lunchtime <laughs> last week, so we'll really try to condense it into your time frame today. And um, this, is just, this just shows the process of carrying out this plan, uh, that we gather a lot about existing conditions. Throughout the whole process, we're talking about goals and policies and uh, kind of evolving those as we go through the process. We look at future growth and how that works on on the existing roadway network plus projects that we know are funded and in the works right now. And then we look at what the future needs are and can we pay for those future needs and so, and uh, what can we pay for? And, and that helps us prioritize projects. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we have a ton of public and stakeholder input opportunities throughout the process. And um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Michael. He's the project manager for this and he's been with it the whole way. <coughs> Uh, good morning, Commissioners. Um, as Cindy said, um, in the development of this plan, we've started off with um, some goals and objectives that we want to integrate into the plan. And you can see that these goals and objectives here um, were used not only to drive the policy direction of the plan, but used to uh, drive the prioritization of projects as well. Um, here are just a couple uh, of the, the stated goals, kind of our, our broad-based main goals that are included in the plan. But there are many goals and policies that are included in the plan in, in different sections and the individual modal sections. Um, the plan, or Metrocog, focuses on all surface transportation modes of transportation. So roadway, bicycle and pedestrian, freight, 
Um, we do get into some rail as well. Um, and so we've addressed those elements um, in each individual section of the plan. Here are some policies uh, that we've included in the plan. I'll call out one in particular under the roadway congestion policies that we're really focusing on balancing the livability and mobility of the region. And what that basically means is that we are looking um, at choosing routes that have mobility focus and looking at routes that have more of a livability that people, it won't create a barrier to other forms of transportation and make areas <coughs> um, better for pedestrian and bicycle uh, transportation. Um, and so we're really looking at balancing um, when we're looking at congestion or capacity or uh, individual routes that, that go through especially suburb, suburban or um, areas with uh, high households and looking at how those um, corridors move traffic and how residents get get tra traverse those those routes but also looking at system connectivity as a whole and just uh, you know how the system uh, is connected to one another we know that because of the interstate and drains that sometimes the roadway network can become disconnected, which puts a burden on certain routes. Um, get into bicycle and pedestrian. Um, this one, I'll just focus on that. We are really looking at developing a trail network that's separate from roadways. A lot of the trails that we do put on are what we call <coughs> side paths that are along roadways. Um, the, we've heard throughout the public participation that this is not necessarily the most attractive um, avenue for people to, to walk and bike. Um, so looking at where we can have those off street uh, facilities. Uh, transit, um, we didn't focus very highly on transit within this plan because transit does their own five year plan uh, separate from this document, uh, their own five year update and we're actually embarking on that study in 2020. Um, and so we, do, we did integrate a lot of the goals that they've already stated um, through our planning efforts with them. Uh, there are a lot of other goals that, we've, that we're looking at in this plan. Again, that balancing livability and mobility is in there. Um, but there are a number of new uh, areas that we'll need to focus on when this region becomes a transportation management area, which basically means that we go over 200,000 population. Um, and with that, we have to do congestion management efforts and look at data and, and gather different kinds of data. We know that there are some uh, new technologies that may be coming down the road within the life of this plan, given that it, there's a 25 year horizon on this plan. And so we just wanted to, you know, pay some, some due notice to some of that technology and how that might affect the transportation network. So a little bit of existing conditions. Uh, currently we, set, we look at a lot of metrics um, that <coughs> impact the transportation network. Uh, probably the, the largest one here is safety. Um, so we do a safety analysis um, in our region, and we've been doing this, um, collecting data and looking at performance measurement on, of how many um, fatalities and serious injury crashes there are throughout the region. However, this is just a listing that we do every um, MTP cycle of the 20 high, highest crash locations in the region. And you can see there's a high correlation between um, the corridors uh, that have commercial uses, re mostly retail uses, and crash incident. And we know that there's a lot of traffic there. Um, there's a lot of access points. There's a lot of uh, it, those intersections have a lot of conflict points. Uh, so it's it's not anything you know new that that we've seen. However, I, what I'll say is that just because they're high crash locations doesn't make them dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just they're the highest in our area. So we just want to make sure that we're doing everything possible to mitigate uh, uh, crashes in uh, uh, those locations. And, uh, and on the Moorhead side and the Clay County side, the, the one at 8th Street and, and uh, is, the, is being studied right now, right? With the 1075 study? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so another metric that we track is existing pavement conditions. This is a page directly out of the plan. Here's that map blowing up. Um, this is the pavement conditions on our NHS routes. Um, what we kind of see from this map is that within the life of this plan, the interstate in our area, both on the Minnesota side and the North Dakota side, will need to be reconstructed. Uh, that's what the pavement models, both NDDOT and MnDOT, tell us. And so in this plan, we specifically call out that project and say, at some time during the life of this plan, 
plan for the interstate to be torn up. So is that 94? 94 and 29. And then they do it a bunch of 29. They've done a lot of outside of our area, but not in the heart. And and we know there are some maintenance activities that need to occur, like on the tri stack um, and on the um, okay. the bridge in West Fargo. And I'll actually call that out here. Yeah, There's Min a bridge. MnDOT has told us that they are planning to do to do reconstruction of 94 in within the next 10 years. Okay. So, uh, you know, we wanna, <coughs> definitely want to look at this in terms of operations and, and study it. Do, what, what kind of a length would that go from the river or how far east would it go? I know it would go through our metropolitan area. I can't tell you how far east beyond that. Okay. Yep. So we also not only look at pavement condition, but bridge condition. There's only one uh, deficient bridge in our region, and you can see that's over in West Fargo. There's a red dot there, and that's the bridge um, that uh, gives uh, access from US 10 to I-94. Oh, yeah, if there's a pointer, that would be great. Yep, right there. Um, NDDOT is aware of this deficiency, and they're planning on doing some work on that structure uh, to get it back up to standard. But otherwise, we are meeting and exceeding all of our, our pavement and bridge condition standards. So as we get into kind of the traffic discussion of the plan, uh, it's good to mention that the base year for this plan is actually 2015 is when we did a lot of our data development. So we took traffic counts and um, bought household and job data. Um, and so all of the, the base level information in this plan is 2015. And you can see uh, in this plan, uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I always like to call out the Cheyenne Street Corridor Project um, because there was a, yeah, I lost the, the, there was a high level of congestion along that corridor, and in fact, kind of a dangerous situation with traffic queuing on the interstate, and that was one of the highest priorities of the last plan, and and now it has uh, just about done with construction, I believe, um, at least the interchange is, and. Um, you'll see in the future maps that that red will go away. Um, so that's a direct output of this, the MTP planning process, is that we program that, that project. So we'll get into some of the, the existing uh, network and the future growth that we're seeing. So as you can see, this is 2045 existing plus committed. This is basically looking at households and jobs out into the future and then using that to generate traffic and put it on the existing system. Um, so everything that the projects that we've done up until now and that we have programmed in a document that we call the Transportation Improvement Program that looks four years out into the future. Um, so everything that's within that's funded within that plan uh, and that's currently being constructed uh, is is put into the model. And you can see that red disappears there uh, at Cheyenne Street um, because of those improvements. But a, this is a little bit of a misnomer because we actually load the system with traffic that's occurring in the southwest region um, and um, kind of in the, the south and the east in, in Moorhead. Um, however, uh, there's no roadway uh, network down there, and so it's loading all of that traffic onto sometimes gravel roadways and, and roadways that were not designed to, to handle that traffic. We know in the future, though, that there are going to be roadways that are developed in those areas as neighborhoods come online, and so this is not necessarily um, the best, and we'll get into the fiscally constrained network. It's though. really for the purpose of helping yeah. identify future needs, this analysis is. Yeah. So what is that, you know, for years or, you know, we've gone back and forth uh, with Clay County and Cass County and Fargo in terms of a future bridge in, um, mm -hmm. across the Red River South. Yeah. Is, are, is that being addressed through the study? It, we, it is, actually. Yeah, we Go do ahead. have some graphics that will okay. show that. And uh, it's not within the fiscally, beyond right-of-way preservation, it's not within the fiscally constrained. Okay, so it's not showing a need? Project, is, that, is that what that the, means? Or? Well, it's partly that because there's just limited growth in South Moorhead, and it's it's partly because, uh, so in terms of, you know, where, where traffic is going to, it's not that there isn't a demand, it's it's that the alternative routes like 52nd Avenue or, or I-94 haven't really gotten overly congested yet with our 2045 growth. Now, 
that remain you know mm -hmm. yeah. as we as we go five years down, you know every five year cycle on this plan right. it's it's I think it's bound to show up at some point so then the question is well do we widen you know does 52nd Avenue become uh, and, and 60th on the Clay County side does that become uh, a six lane arterial because that would have a significant amount of impacts to development on the Fargo side or do we start you know heighten the, the planning and programming of the 76th Avenue corridor and so that's we definitely want that corridor to be preserved and mm -hmm. it really is the only opportunity <coughs> as you go south towards 112th or um, towards the that next interchange to the South. So. so remind me again, 70. That's in that's on the Fargo that's side. That's on the Fargo so side. Wouldn't that be yes, in, yes. And it lines up with, set with 67, County Road 67, County 80th, 80th Avenue. Okay, and County Road 67. County okay. Mm -hmm. okay. I got a question. Uh, what's the current population of the Metrocog area right now? It's about 212,000 for our metropolitan area now. And then in this 2045 projection, what was that projection that they made? Question. Okay. Um, 245 it's, or 250? I think it's in the 250 it's or 260 range. At least. It's, yep. um, but that's shockingly part of, higher. Right, but the 2020 mm -hmm. numbers we have been talking about, bump, I mean, that obviously will change that. Right, 2020 census will, right now the 2012 is a census estimate for 2018, and, and our metro area grows about 4,500 a year. So by 2020, we're probably looking at about, you know, over 220. And so um, I, I'm, I, I believe the 2045 projection is <coughs> around 300,000. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's significant. significant. Yeah, yeah, and then, and household growth is over 30,000. Job growth is around 50,000. So, I mean, I'm giving, I'm drawing from memory here, which isn't always perfect, <laughs> not even close. But that's um, that's close enough. Yeah, it's it's a you know significant and and kind of takes your breath away. Sustained growth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. And we do have a plan on our website that we used for these modeling efforts. The it's a data development plan um, that you can look at. And it, we had a demographer on that plan. They did a, a demographic study of the area and, and projected population out to 2045. I just can't come up with that number okay. off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Um, so now we'll get into some of the future needs. We'll see that in 2045, uh, trips will increase um, somewhere around 40%. Vehicle miles traveled, um, somewhere around 65% increase. Vehicle hours traveled, um, so about 70%, between 65 and 70%. Uh, your average trip length go, will go up approximately 20%. Um, and that's really due to where households are located in comparison to where jobs are located. Um, a lot of the growth is occurring kind of on the fringe areas. Mm -hmm. um, but average speeds will not, uh, will only decrease by a small percentage, one to three percent. And we kind of see that there's a lot of capacity in the system. The system operates fairly well. Um, and uh, we think that uh, the system that we have um, is, is pretty good uh, going off into the future, at least with these population estimates and traffic estimates. And so, um, we're, we're really focusing on that livability versus mobility again uh, factor when, when we're looking at travel, uh, where should traffic be going and, and looking at the efficiency of the system rather than adding capacity. Um, so getting into some of those ADT thresholds, um, the one I'd like to call out is on I-94 at the Red River Bridge. Um, we're predicting uh, approximately 100,000 uh, cars a day on that bridge. We've no um, in conversations with NEDOT, uh, Fargo District, uh, that there have been traffic volumes this summer around the 80,000 mark. And so I don't think it's too far off um, of an estimate uh, for 20 to 25 years in the future to have this level of traffic on that bridge. I think during, some, during periods of construction, North Dakota DOT said 84,000 was kind of a sustained number for um, quite a bit of July. What is the I I twenty I ninety four at Tri Stack? What intersection is that? It's I twenty Tri level. Oh, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So we'll get into this. Uh, we did a very robust fiscal analysis um, of this in this plan, and that's basically to estimate um, what we can likely receive in federal funding out to the year 2045. Um, there were a lot of assumptions made. When we become a TMA, we will get a direct allocation of federal funds um, that could be spent in this region. On the North Dakota side, that would be about 12 and a half million a year. However, on the Minnesota side, it's only about a million a year. And that's a function of the number of MPOs there are in the state of Minnesota versus uh, there are in the state of North Dakota and the population of uh, the Minnesota side of our urban area. So, so does the, the TMA replace the MPO on the North Dakota side? Is that how that? It's just a different just, level of yeah. MPO. Okay. Yes. Yeah. There's two tier. Yeah. It's a two tier okay. system. We'll just evolve, transform into that, and uh, and it, it brings with it additional reporting requirements, data, data analysis, like Michael said, mm -hmm. um, additional responsibilities in terms of managing that twelve and a half million and making sure that it gets spent in a timely manner and not that projects don't lag and uh, you know DOT wants us to spend that money every year. So we'll have to be working with our local jurisdictions to phase in projects and you know that use that amount but don't uh, require more than that. And and I, Michael was probably already gonna say that, but it, say this, but in Minnesota, there's so many different ways of funding state aid routes and things like that, that um, it is not surprising, I guess, that the MPO amount is Significantly less, just because yeah. of the. So if, if I if I can, so so the the MPO on the Minnesota side that would stay at about a million dollars. You said right? Is that? Yeah, our surface transportation block grant program, which is the federal funds we receive for, for the roadway network, would be about a million a year. And and how big how big of an area is the MPO on the Minnesota side? It's obvious well, all of Moorhead. Our urban area is Moorhead and Dilworth. Okay, so and that's where those funds can be and that's used. Where, okay, that's that's what I was getting at is where those funds can be used. Okay. Yep. All right. Um, yeah, and like Cindy said, there's so many different funding ways in, in especially uh, bonding, Minnesota bonds for a lot of their major mm -hmm. uh, projects. So we see that this can that million dollars can do a lot of maintenance projects, but not much else. There's also a lot of of uh, MINDOT money, though, that comes in, and and, and right. you guys have a seat as the MPO on that district. The Area Transportation Partnership? Yeah, yep. mm -hmm. yeah, we do. Okay, yeah. So as we get into the future, <clears throat> um, you can see this is the projected funding over the life of this plan. Um, on the Minnesota side, it's about 31 million. And on the North Dakota side, it's about 361 million. We do think, on the at least on the North Dakota side, that that is enough to meet the needs of the area, both system preservation and system expansion, and, and some of the other uh, modal investments that we would like to make. Um, however, we do not control monies that are destined for the interstate. Those are controlled by the DOTs, and so we did include those projects in our plan, but we just had to say that those aren't fiscally constrained. Um, so this is the project. Um, all of the fiscally constrained projects in our area, um, as you can see, they're they're mo mostly in our urban area, except for the some of the interstate reconstruction, um, and so not necessarily um, some you know not a lot of impact to Clay County, I would say, Maybe but the yeah, but we do have a. Um, a bridge project, a future bridge project on 52nd, um, just to, to reconfigure. That bridge has already been designed for four-lane facility, but the, the roadway needs to be reconfigured in order to meet that. We'll see that that going in, that ne that project necessary in the future. Was there Excuse a date me. on that? What's that? Is there a projected date on that? Um, yeah, it's in the near, or in the midterm. Okay. Yeah. We, we've seen a lot of growth stall because of the diversion project, so not a lot of development has been occurring in the south area. However, on the Horace side, it's still occurring because they're dry, right. but they're more impacting the Cheyenne Street corridor. Right. But as um, the diversion moves forward um, and growth is allowed to continue past 52nd on the, you know, in that area, we see the operations of 52nd 
being impacted. Which is even more important why you guys should be active in those diversion authority meetings. <laughs> I mean, if we're talking about future, I mean, I know I've said this at a large number of meetings lately, mm -hmm. but continue there so that we can use the information in the plans. Yeah, and I think we will, I, I, I've spoken with the um, chair, uh, Chair Sherling uh, at, at Cass County about uh, participating in the land uh, committee mm -hmm. and uh, their joint powers agreement limits us from being an ex officio member in that. It's currently the ex officio, the flexibility that they have is used to give Horace, the city of Horace, a right. seat at that, in that committee. But, but we can, she said that um, we should feel free to attend and, and so we'll start doing that. But, mm -hmm. yeah, can, I, can I just add the red dotted line that goes west of the diversion area, what, what is that? There, there are lands being acquired um, for the diversion that exceed the amount that's needed because most of the farmers don't just want to sell right. the, the required strip. They want to sell a quarter section or a half section right. or whatever is affected. And so that's what's, what's happening. And with the, when the Cass County Comprehensive Plan was being done a couple of years ago, the, the county engineer saw an opportunity to provide a west ring road um, which has always been part of the discussion of, you know, long-range transportation planning in our metropolitan area, and and it's, and it's what resulted in the 336 corridor being what it is today. And you know, it's it's a fantastic facility mm -hmm. on the east side right. as a ring route, and something I use on a regular basis going to and from Minnesota and my mm -hmm. home and everything. So, have a lot of appreciation for that. And MnDOT and and Clay County have been um, integral part of getting that developed and. But on the west side, it's just, it's just been a struggle. Um, corridors like 52nd Avenue that have been identified in the past have been kind of, you know, clogged up with traffic signals and that and have, haven't really facilitated it, that as a ring route. And so uh, Jason Benson, the Cass County engineer, really started looking at this and the availability of land on the, on the west side for that type of a facility. Okay. So that's the planning area for that. We can't really designate a for sure route, but that, that would be the study area. That's the concept that would be there. Would be, that would serve similar to the 336. Correct. Yes, the that's side. the concept. Mm -hmm. It okay. would have an interchange with uh, yeah. the interstate and mm -hmm. uh, uh, be a limited access type of facility. There are county roads in that area especially between on the north side of I-94 that get used in a similar manner already by uh, people heading, like say, between Grand Forks and Bismarck, for example, who don't want to traverse our, our urbanized area. Those are, those are the 336 and that one would, you know, I think Fargo more has, has a tendency to be further north and south and east and west, and I, I, I liken that to when uh, the Minneapolis-St. Paul area did did the 494 and 694. Yeah. It was kind of that mm -hmm. same concept to kind of get everything away from, mm -hmm. or the, the highway traffic just being able to bypass. Right. So. Yeah, and just give that a, a better ease of access to the people that that right. live on the south or in the north as well. Because we know that <coughs> you saw the volumes there, mm -hmm. that farther off from this, this plan as growth continues in our area, and we do predict growth continuing, that the internal operations of the interstate system will be severely impacted mm -hmm. if, if there aren't alternate routes. Right. 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 Um, so these are just a number of, of projects um, uh, in, our, in our plan. Um, I'll kind of just uh, skip through them. This is the vision plan that <coughs> we had mentioned earlier, and this includes that that bypass or ring route there um, in the in Clay County, you can see uh, going through Sabin and out and out to the interstate with 52nd Avenue Bridge. Um, 76 or 76 Avenue, Avenue yeah, Bridge. 80, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. and the Minnesota side. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a number of of different interchanges that Moorhead was interested in. Um, you can see on 55th. And the other one would be an extension of 12th Avenue, I believe. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then some improvements um, to 336 as well um, to solidify that, that ring route over there. Mm -hmm. And there's another, isn't there a, um, 
a proposed um, exit uh, between 336 and... Right, where that KOA is? That yeah, so yeah. 52nd Street. Is that what right. it is? Yep. Yeah. So that, yeah. Is that, does that show up in your model to your plan? Yeah, I believe that's the... I, I, it's pretty small. I, I can't, can't see that. that. <laughs> It's, yeah, it's but it's there anyway. The, yeah, it's it's the one on I ninety four there. If I can get the I most. see it on the screen. Right. Look at oh, right there. oh yeah. is, there that's it right there. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, there you go. Right okay. Yeah. However, we we've no <laughs> we've received um, a SOV letter from the airport uh, um, solicitation of use letter. Um, we know that structures in that area are not permitted because of the flight line. And so we're going to have to look at that very closely um, when we're ready. From the Moorhead. From the, mm -hmm. yeah. The other issue is the way station. And so. Yeah. yeah. So the, there are a number of issues that we know. However, these projects are kind of far off um, in our plan, and, and we're not able to fund them, and that's why they're kind of in this right. visionary portion of the plan. But I think it's important that route coming out of Sabre <coughs> is a, a gravel road. And so if Correct. it is on a vision, yep. it needs to be on a, our county vision as well. Yeah, we wanted to make sure to carry for, forward those visionary projects in the plan. Right. For instance, that ring road discussion has been in our plans for decades. So we wanted to make sure to, to bring that forward. I, I know uh, a long time ago when we were talking about this, there was also... Uh, do, do you still do you still sign things where it says future corridor or something like that or was that, road. yeah yeah limited access high f future limited access high volume arterial yeah yeah do you, do you do you still do that type of thing we we do not but in the past MetroCog worked with the county engineers to try to get those signs out out on the roads mm -hmm. you know on the perimeter and uh, that's something we could we could do it again. We haven't done that for many years as far as I know. That was that was back in the nineties that that was put into place and I you know, those yeah, those served a good purpose. Well I you know, I I guess my my concern is you start you know, if you have people buying land or finding mm -hmm. wanting different uses for that, you know, not realizing, you know, what the future needs of the community is going to be in those areas, it can become harder to make those plans later. And I, I agree with you. I think that's something maybe we should seriously talk about. That route specifically mm -hmm. has had a number of new, new homes built on it in the last seven or eight years, and that would it might even be something that planning the planning should, should should look at too. Right. I mean, just. I mean, it doesn't mean that you exclude development, but you certainly have to. I think you disclose, disclose that, that that this this probably will be coming at some point in time in the future. Mm -hmm. you know, so. We can work with the county engineers. We can yeah, we'll like bring that. that up at one of our future meetings, and and uh, and, and, and Commissioner Mosher serves on our planning commission too, so she could probably maybe see about getting that as an agenda item on there too, but. Good point. All right. Yeah, I just those are the <laughs> slides calling out those projects we already talked about. Um, so there are a number of bicycle and pedestrian projects uh, in the plan. Uh, one of particular importance is the Heartland Trail. I know Dan Farnsworth in our office has been working very diligently on that planning effort um, that runs through Clay County there. Um, I believe this was an alignment um, that was kind of put together at the beginning of that planning effort. However, I'm not sure that the, this alignment is necessarily solidified, um, but it's kind of what we're operating on currently and what's in our bicycle and pedestrian plan. Um, so this is the all of the bike projects uh, that we have planned within the project. Oh, go ahead. You, you may know, you may be aware of this, but that project is, uh, is currently in the proposed bonding bill and uh, for I think that it was on the tour for the legislature recently, and I, I think it probably came in at a point where it's going to be kind of a low priority this time around, but it would allow it to rise as time goes on. Um, and then this is the, oop, 
sorry, the vision plan for bike and pets of all of those projects that are not fiscally constrained. Um, and so, last slide here. There are some recommendations that have come out of the study on things that we should that we should look at in the next five years um, before we update the plan. Um, again, um, it's kind of funny that we're already planning on our, our next update and looking at the steps that we'll be, need to take. Uh, but a, as we go forward, um, looking at how that interstate operates, uh, given some of our model outcomes, um, some future corridor studies, uh, especially Trunk Highway 10 in <coughs> Dilworth, we're, currently we're doing a US 1075 corridor study um, because MnDOT has said in 2025 they're going to come and reconstruct uh, US 10 and 75. And the limits of that project are 24th um, yeah. Avenue in the south, and then it goes up 8th there, um, and then US 10 from the river to 8th. And then the, the two, the, the current alignment of US 10 and 75 and the proposed realignment. Um, and then following US 1075 out to the intersection and then following out to 34th Street. Um, and so that's the current, but where we leave off on the, in the Dilworth line, then we, we need to pick that up and then go to 336 and, and look at the needs for that corridor as that will likely be the next project that they've said maybe occur shortly after that 2025 project if they get funding. question no <laughs> okay uh, so that, that's just some of the, the the projects that we know that we're going to be studying within the next couple of years after the, the completion of this planning effort okay thank you for that update and with this but do you need a resolution that uh, the that is correct. Yeah, support the plan or not support it whatever yes we have a we're, we're, we need Resolutions of support for the plan from each jurisdiction before we can get our final uh, Federal Highway Administration approval of our plan. Okay, we've got resolution 2019-37 in front of you. And move approval. Second. Any further discussion? Now we've got a motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion approved. Thank you very much Thank for you. your time Thank this morning. You. And with that, we'll move up to Tim. Uh, internal funds to replace upgrade of time data storage and equipment in the county data center. Good morning. Good morning, Tim. Okay, so I have uh, two separate requests here that are somewhat similar. Uh, the first request is a upgrade to our existing data storage appliance in our data center. Um, that's our data storage for all county departments. Um, we're getting somewhat critically low on space on that device and we're requesting an upgrade. The, uh, the second request is a, an actual equipment replacement of our CaseWorks data storage device. CaseWorks is the, uh, the system where we have 11 counties that we host here at Clay County. Those funds are uh, collected with the hosting, uh, the hosting uh, bills that we send out every year. So uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the county production storage device that the funds are in the equipment replacement fund for that device. So you say these 11 counties here that we do, if we <coughs> approve this, that's going to be a burden or cost. Well, funds are already collected from those counties. You've already collected from those counties? Yes. They're continually do. collected. Correct. Correct. We do an annual billing each year, and in that billing, a portion of that um, goes towards county staff costs, and a portion of it goes towards equipment replacement to maintain that hosting environment. And there are enough funds to, uh, to cover this cost. Okay. So the 84, uh, 462, those funds we have 
uh, set aside for this already. Correct. Yep. And then the uh, other one, the 84986, that's internal service funds you want to use. Is correct. that is that? That's correct. Um, do we know what we have in internal service funds for that replacement of that or? The total? I do not. I, I talked to Lori last week and she confirmed that there was funds okay. available for this purpose. I know when, just to, for example, when we do when we do our highway stuff, when, you know, we usually usually has, you know, um, this was the cost of this particular <coughs> machine. This is how much we have in there, and then are are we are we taking extra out to do this, or is there still a surplus? And I, I guess it'd, it'd just be nice to know that. I, I I'm assuming you, I yeah, trust that you need it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, de definitely. I mean, we've met with almost every department that's getting critically low on space, and their their data needs are increasing. Um, you know, we're storing larger type files like video and and images. Um, so our our uh, our need is is increasing quickly. Um, now that the the IT equipment is done a little bit differently than the. Uh, you know, we have this discussion, I think, every year regarding our IT equipment. Um, Lori can explain it better than I, but kind of lumped into it. It's a uh, lump sum. Yeah. I suppose it's difficult to control, manage hundreds and hundreds of individual pieces, I suppose. Right, and, and a lot of our PCs are you know, under $1,000, mm -hmm. so those aren't uh, capitalized the same as, you know, even though we might spend mm -hmm. Eighty thousand dollars in one year on PCs. You put that into your budget. Well, those are still re those are still internal services for out of internal services. Yes. Okay. So I'm not sure how exactly Lori does that in the background. But. <coughs> well, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the request. I think it's definitely warranted. I understand the need and the data piece, but I agree with Commissioner Campbell. I need a little better understanding about the internal service fund and what's on the horizon in that piece. So. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Okay, well, I might, um, we have a motion, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Okay, with that, we'll go into committee reports. Uh, I think I'm going to start out. Mine will be the shortest. You know, so. <laughs> ah, well, last week uh, I can give you a report on what I did in Nashville, but we'll let that go. The week before, uh, I was at the Wild West Watershed Board, and there they're talking about buying out some flood-prone area north of Hendrum. And the other thing they're talking about is the same thing that we're talking about here in Lake County, is the land that they lease or own, should they sell it or mm -hmm. should they keep on? Where's, where's the best thing? Oh, Lori, did you want to add on to that uh, internal service fund there? Well, I can just explain. Uh, this particular item, um, Tim's items are lump sum, and this so this one didn't have a specific amount for it, but we have over 600,000 in the unallocated area, which this applies to the whole county. <coughs> so I think that's a good place to take it. Okay. And then, and then that's that's replenished then through Correct. the annual budget process. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you. Thanks for coming up, Lori. <laughs> Made good time. <laughs> Must been watching TV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean they got like I say they got the same situation we do. The land that they own should they keep it or should they try to sell it? You know where is it more profitable? And the discussion was held on that. The other thing I did, I went to, um, oh, that bus route probably, Jenny talked about it last oh. week. Uh, the, the, they're starting the- Rural transportation. The, the Lakes and Prairie Community Action Partnership, they're doing the bus route, and I attended the Holly one, and they had, uh, I guess it's very interesting I mean, to see what, what can come out of this. You know, there's transportation available for these people, and they're doing a good thing there. And, and the one thing I did, I met with this Holly Dutton, she was at the, at each presentation there. And I met with her and I said, well, we should explain this to the townships, you know, because the townships evidently weren't there at the meeting. It was just they met at the senior citizen, but you know, there's a few people that showed up. So 
I asked her to make a presentation at the township meeting. It was coming up, I think, in November 18th or something like that. So I think they'll be there at that, at that meeting to explain that further to the townships. So. Okay, Jim. I didn't have anything. Very good. Jenny, you want to go? Sure. Uh, last week, Commissioner Campbell and I had some discussions with our uh, highway engineer about um, the large amount of road concerns that we had been getting. And uh, they worked with the Sheriff's Department to put out a press release about the state of the roads and we're, um, it's been a challenge to get to them. And so I just publicly want to say that we've really been working on those concerns. And I know they continued, especially now with this extra rain, my phone has been ringing a lot. So uh, just if there are specific concerns, I encourage people to reach out to the highway department or one of us to relay those concerns. I have had several conversations with different individuals over the last week in regards to county lands. Uh, I had an individual talking about what a hayland lease on some property in Elkton Township and then uh, had a area trail, trail builders group that was interested in possibly putting bike trails on one of our, on the uh, uh, future landfill site on North uh, uh, Highway 10. Anyways, included, encourage them to reach out to us and get on that county lands meeting that we'll be having in November. So hopefully they'll do that. Uh, had a law library, uh, one, one issue was that we approved the West Law contract that was <coughs> needing to be approved for the end of the month. But other than that, that concludes my report. Okay, you know what? Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, on the uh, 16th, uh, we had a uh, diversion uh, meeting with the um, executive group and we um, had a visit from Major General Toy, uh, was here and uh, uh, he, sp he spent a day out looking at uh, the project and the work being done and uh, certainly gave us a, you know, strong encouragement and backing by the U.S. Corps that they still want to, this is a still top priority to them. Um, he said that in the St. in the St. Paul district, he wanted, to, he wanted to be able to see the top two projects um, for that entire district. And, and of course, this was one of the two that was chosen by the St. Paul district for him to, <coughs> to come and view. So that was nice to see him here. On uh, Thursday morning, we had our uh, West Central Regional Juvenile Detention quarterly meeting. And there, uh, Tom from Construction at Zeers gave an update on the project. Uh, we did talk about the uh, contingencies and, and that outline as far as what we would do for it, similar to what we showed here at last week's meeting. We talked a little bit about uh, uh, the future food service, and that it'll be the preparation will be done from our correctional facility and brought there. Um, and I think that's kind of a review of that. And then um, yesterday we had a diversion um, authority chairs coordinating meeting. And there's, as a matter of fact, that's where our current board chair is today. They're, um, they left for Washington, D.C. this morning. Uh, they have several meetings going on with OMB and, and the Corps and other you know, legislators there um, work, working on that project. Uh, we talked a little bit more about the next steps with the WIFIA. Uh, that's the funding uh, program that we've been invited to partake in and have been approved. And that process is a long process. Um, there's a calendar events that stretches out an entire year before that's actually done. It's John Shockley is working on that and he's doing an amazing job with that. Um, let's see, I want to make sure I, that, I guess that concludes my report. Okay. The, um, oh, oh, excuse I apologize. Me. I had one other item. The Buffalo, uh, we got these packets, but the Buffalo Red Watershed did go to Wilkin County on the 15th and they approved the, both resolutions for the consideration for 2020. 
Thank you, Commissioner Gross. Uh, on the 16th, I participated in Central Administration meeting. Uh, we talked about the campus campus roads project that finally was able to be completed and looks looks very nice out there. Uh, talked about the preparations that's that are taking place in, in the boardroom here to uh, as. Uh, this becomes a, a magistrate uh, courtroom here in the future. We don't have any any set dates yet, uh, but uh, they're working towards uh, towards that. Open enrollment uh, started uh, this past Thursday, uh, and uh, again, uh, deadline for that is November 8th. Uh, the benefit of kind of pushing it back with the, with the enrollment uh, is that it will allow some of our employees to also look outside uh, on the open market. Uh, because of the changes that we made this year, the uh, HR has provided uh, three different uh, open enrollment informational meetings and we had over 100 employees that participated in those three sessions. So that was, that was great to see. Uh, we also discussed a safety committee, uh, the unannounced drill that they did in the Family Service Center this last month, some of the, uh, the benefits that they, that they saw in some of the areas that we need to, to uh, shore up. So that was beneficial. We talked about the network, network storage issue that was this morning. Uh, also would note that the speed bumps have been removed uh, out in the parking lots uh, and, and uh, encourage our employees and our citizens to continue to, to, uh, uh, to, to be careful in those different areas. Um, I met with Darren and Kirk uh, about uh, some ongoing coverage of the window in, in uh, HR and solid waste to make sure that we're serving the public properly. I uh, also participated yesterday in the diversion chair meeting that Commissioner Campbell uh, has mentioned. Uh, just uh, I did provide you each packets uh, and agenda items for our District 4 AMC meeting. Again, it's going to be a little bit different than maybe what our previous district meetings were actually going to have an agenda uh, uh, that focuses on, on uh, funding uh, for, for road projects and then trying to work together as counties to, to uh, look, go through some different options uh, and uh, come forward with, a, with a, the best plan. I have invited Dave Overbo. He'll also be attending. Uh, Governor Walls has, has uh, come out with a bonding tour. Uh, he is going to be here in Moorhead on October 29th. Uh, the time, and time is not yet set, but I, I do know that our transfer station is one of the areas that will be uh, toured and discussed. And uh, I have uh, just to follow, continue to follow up. I, we, I have uh, we reached out to Becker County in regards to the wild rice manager uh, issue. Uh, I have not uh, have not uh, had any, I guess, response back to our invitation to meet next week. Uh, I, Mike Breathorst was here last week when I was gone. Uh, he was I think he was here for the juvenile center meeting, uh, but uh, I've not heard anything yet at this point. I'll follow up with that. That concludes my report. Just to enlighten me a little bit, of it, uh, you said the Buffalo watershed, Wilton County approved it. So that does that mean Wilton County would? They just need one political subdivision to approve it. So that it will Clay County too, then, or it uh, includes all of it. Correct. Yes. Now the tax will show up for every Clay County property. Yep. In spite of it. It's the agreement. Okay. Anything further, Colleen? Yeah. Already. We're adjourned. <laughs>